I've started. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to today's conversation. Thank you so much for joining. Um, please, as you come in, just indicate for us where you're coming from. Um, let us know who's in the room and we'll be excited to, to know who's there with us today. Thank you, we'll start. We'll start shortly, thank you. Oh, great. So my name is Ada Ezekoli. I'm the editor-in-chief here at the Africa Policy Journal. Thank you for joining us again for today's conversation on soft power, a catalyst for the transformation of African peoples. We are delighted to be having this conversation in partnership with the Africa Soft Power Project, um, who has been doing work around elevating the concerns and issues around soft power and um, founder and creative director of, of the Africa Soft Power Project in Kiru Balong is here with us today. Um, thank you, Kiru, for being here. I will quickly um, introduce our panelists for today's conversation, and then we will get into it. If you have questions, please um, use the Q&A feature to ask your questions and our team will be monitoring that, uh, the chat and the questions and then hopefully we'll get to some of your questions. So before I introduce the panelists, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what soft power is, at least the way I understand it and our esteemed guests will throw further light on it. So the term was actually coined um, by Joseph S. Nye Jr., who was a Harvard University Distinguished Service Professor and former senior member of the U.S. Military Intelligence Complex, which I found really interesting. And the simplest definition that I found was basically the ability to affect the behavior of others by persuasion and positive attraction. And this is actually used in contrast to hard power, which is controlled coercion and force. Um, so today's conversation is going to look at how do we as African peoples leverage the impact of soft power to transform our experiences and to transform our influence in the globe. Um, and I'm really delighted to introduce our panelists. First, I will introduce Nkiru Balung. Um, and Kiru is the founder and creative director of the Africa Soft Power Project. She's a strategic communications and stakeholder engagement specialist with extensive experience in advising local and international organizations on emerging market strategies, gender equality policies, strategic cost partnerships, and social impact strategies. Her work includes a strong focus on women's issues and the cultural and creative industries. And Kiru, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Eba Kalondo. Eba is the spokesperson to the chairperson of the African Union Commission. Ms. Eba, she's the, she, prior to being at the African Union Commission, she has held several senior positions in strategic and risk communications at the World Health Organization, Foundation Hirondelle, France 24, and Reuters. Thank you so much for being here, um, Eva. I'd like to introduce Desta Haile, who is the Deputy Director of the Royal African Society. She is a creative 
multilingual British Eritrean writer, educator, and consultant with a background in intercultural communication, social justice, and the performing arts. Previously, she worked as African Region Capacity Building Manager and Coordinator for the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts. In 2020, Desta won to speak Europe in different languages at the Babel Festival of Literature and Translation, a writing competition. Um, in 2021, she received the Afri Tondo Short Story Prize. It's great to be here. Um, it's great to have you here with us today, Desta. I'd like to introduce Tisa Smart Washington. Tisa is a tax, tax commissioner at Rockdale County in Georgia, um, where she has been serving um, since 2013. Prior to joining that office, she served as communication writer in the office of the CEO of the Cobb County and as the editor of the Rockdale News. Um, I'd like to ask our panelists to kindly turn on your videos and as we start the conversation. So my first question actually goes to Nkiru. Um, I want you to reflect, to talk to us a little bit about why you think soft power is important. Um, why, why you think soft power is important. You wrote in, um, in your website on the Africa Soft Power Project that growing up most of your heroes were American and you talk about how you even had an American twang even before you left the country. Um, but later on, you got to understand that being, you got to be, you, you got to understand the pride of being an African woman. And you say, I believe in our ability to change our prospects through our creative power. And as the African saying goes, until lions have their own historians, tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunter. So can you share with us a little bit about why you think soft power is a crucial conversation that we as African people should be having? Thanks, thank you. Thanks, Ada. Thanks for that. Um, and thanks to the Africa Policy Journal for um, partnering with us on this project. It's really nice to be here. And you know, thanks to all the panelists for being here as well. Um, so thanks. Um, that's a really cool question. Um, so yes, I did write that. And I forgot I wrote that. So um, I wish I'd gone and read it, <laughs> but yeah. So I did say growing up, I think most many of us grew up watching MTV, MTV Base, and literally I could, you know, probably wrap all the stuff I saw on MTV Base, uh, you know, and I, I'm in Nigeria right now, and sort of many of us had like an American twang, and that's just because that's what we watched. Everything we watched was um, um, either American movies, or um, actually there were Indian movies as well. So there was a lot of Bollywood stuff, but literally it was one or the other. And so at every, the end of every movie, you'd see the American soldier or, you know, go rescue everybody. And so when I then went to the States um, uh, um, much later on, I then, you know, I landed in the middle of nowhere and I was like, oh my God, this is, you know, um, this is the States. And I realized that just the same way as back home, there's great stuff everywhere. There's also um, bad stuff in America. I actually always thought that, um, you know, America was this land of honey and uh, everything was perfect there. And so I realized that that's what's happened with us in terms of our storytelling. So the images that you see on TV, the, the stories we tell about um, ourselves, I think particularly for me, what's even more interesting or more um, important is even how we see ourselves, less about how outsiders see us. It's like how we see ourselves, how we reflect when we're thinking about ourselves, how we see, you know, our, um, our diaspora and brothers and sisters. In terms of that, I think that's even a stronger thing to um, 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 talk about when we're talking about soft power. So I started thinking about it. How does, you know, what makes America so powerful? America is powerful because of its diversity of its people. I think that's probably the most important thing. Diversity of its people, the innovation, the thinking, the, you know, just be, the being collaborative. Um, and, and so I thought maybe when we think about the continent, how can we make con the continent more effective as for itself, but also how can it propel itself differently? And that's how we came to the um, idea of doing, and as you said, I sort of studied um, soft power in when I was at uh, uni, I read the book Soft Power by um, um, Joseph Nye that you just mentioned. And I began to reflect on how we could as ourselves as Africans also sort of like um, encompass that for, for the better good of everybody, if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. 
thank you so much for sharing for sharing that and how you came to to begin to have this conversation around soft power. Um, Desta, I want to come to you. You are a vocalist, you're a songwriter, um, and you've performed your own music as well as perform music with, with other people. You also design and create music and theater workshops. So in a way, you're a soft power practitioner. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you and ask, ask you around about in the work that you've that you've done as you know British Eritrean, how have you seen soft power work? What are some of the things you've seen soft power do um, that you think is important for um, Africans and people of African descent to understand and to to be very critical and take a hold of? Uh, sure. In in my own journey, I've seen how music can really bring people together and provide opportunities for, for travel, for employment, for learning. My first job when I was 18 was with Zap Mama, who's a Belgian Congolese artist, um, Grammy nominated. And, you know, it was thanks to her that I, I had one of my first jobs and I was in New York and Tunisia and Australia and New Zealand. and. And that was a huge opportunity for me. And my father had her cassette tape when I was six years old living in Abidjan. So, you know, it's it's it goes against this uh, idea that if you have a job in the arts, you know, it's it's over by your 30s. You know, people can have careers till the end of time uh, in the arts. And also personally, I love theater, especially in education. And um, so I, I went to Brazil. I lived in Rio de Janeiro. And I worked for the Theater of the Oppressed. Mm -hmm. And the Theater of the Oppressed is uh, a system that was created like in the 60s by Augusto Boal that really uses theater um, to transform society, uh, so much so that he was exiled and imprisoned um, and you know, frightening the dictatorship of the time. And now mm -hmm. it's something that's practiced in over 70 countries, it's practiced in prisons, in hospitals, in mental institutions. So when I was interning there, I really got to see how um, theater can be not just entertainment or communication, but can really actually get policy changed, laws changed. Mm -hmm. um, and currently, besides my, my work at Royal African Society, where I see the impact that our festivals have of, of Film Africa and Africa Rights, I'm also consulting mm -hmm. for Malala Fund. And so we're working with activists, activists in Nigeria, Ethiopia, and a few other countries and um, the training that we get as facilitators that we also impart to the women we support are all soft power things photography communication mm -hmm. arts because those are the things that almost effortlessly unite us um, across whatever our backgrounds are so you know whether our activists are in the amazon or in northern nigeria you know these women are able to use these soft our skills to empower not just their community, but you know, um, their wider the the girls and women in their wider network. So, mm -hmm. I've seen soft power in, in so many different ways um, in an African context. And and uh, my my last gig it was at the Royal Albert Hall, and my band were from Ghana, uh, Congo, Cote d'Ivoire, and French Guyana. And so I really you know feel that on a personal level. Um, being able to go and perform at festivals in Africa like Sakifo or uh, the lounge in Tanzania on a personal level as an artist but also as an educator it's mm -hmm. it's everything thank you so much Desa. and in fact I am going to now share your Spotify list <laughs> your Spotify station with everyone so please go and listen to her amazing music um, so we've talked a little bit about how and Kiru mentioned how soft power is important for you know it wasn't Kiru and Desta for the creatives right for ensuring that our call that culture is transferred to so ex exporting in a way culture and the way that um countries in the west have used it also to export you know people think about the American dream they think about when, when, you, when you hear when you, when you think about French people think about French as like the language of love, you know, where do we get that? It has to do with how the French have exported their, you know, their culture. And Desta, you mentioned education, which is really important, helping people to 
uh, to understand the culture, to understand with who we are as Africans and peoples of African descent. And you mentioned something that I think is really key that I want to segue to um, with you, Eba, which is policy. Um, how soft power can, can work um, in, in government and policy spaces. And um, Eba, you worked in international news um, in the past and development, and you have a strong focus on security and humanitarian industry. Um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about in, your, in the work that you do at the AU you know, currently, um, you gave an interview to She Leads Africa, <laughs> which where you talked about how um, the AU has different governance systems and is a home to a third of humanity and is fighting for its rightful place in the world as a primary actor of its own development and also of the world, especially given the unique history of colonialism. Um, in Africa. I want you to talk a little bit about how you see soft power playing a role in policy governance issues at the regional level um, in Africa and how, we, how it is then being used to make a place for us um, on the global scale, both for Africa and also for people's African descent. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to be the boring one and, and go back straight to what you said right at the beginning when you, you gave a short introduction on what soft power is. Um, and, and, and one thing you said and you, uh, that you were surprised that Joseph Nye came from the military intelligence community. Mm. Well, it's not so surprising. Um, and I think that's probably the crux of soft power. We, we talk about it now as how we'd like to, to, to experience it or, or influence our lives and our, and, and our experience of life, whether it be political or otherwise. Um, but I do think that there was intention and design um, in the word and in the direction uh, from whence it flows. It certainly came from just power, whether it's soft or hard, mm -hmm. it certainly has a very primary ob objective, whether it's to do with war or violence, the objection is still to dominate, mm. um, whether it does through by persuasion um, or something that is aspirational and then call it soft power. I think we should not um, shy away from its initial um, objective, which is pure power and mm with the aim to dominate. Um, but for the, for the purposes of this conversation, um, I think it's really about how we would want to redefine something that comes from uh, a hard power conversation of the powerful who understood and comes from military jargon as to how to bet better subjugate and to better dominate through soft power. And, you know, the, the entire... Uh, um, industry of say American cinema, for example, has a very strong operational, financial and other ties to the military establishment and the federal government. You know, um, it's either for recruitment um, or, you know, the glorification of the American soldier going out to, you know, um, give freedom or save or so I, there's nothing altruistic about that mm. in that sense so when it comes into the political and the policy spaces it's important to know where it comes from and how we want to redefine uh, soft power for ourselves um, certainly in the political and policy making uh, environments but also um, in, in in the cultural environments because um, I, I had written something down when I spoke to Nkiru the first time, um, and, I, and I remember saying to her that, you know, for soft power to be, to be able to exert itself or to, 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 uh, or to be recognized, it's that it needs to be acknowledged or recognized as it sees itself. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I say, oh, I want to be seen as this, people who see me must accept what I'm showing to them. So if the gaze towards Africa, towards ourselves, towards who we want to become is not um, 
agreed upon by the person who's looking at us, um, you know, how would we then negotiate that dismissal of the image, given that the gaze that is coming back to you does not acknowledge what it is that you want to be seen as. So I think in Africa, soft power has those types of constraints. America doesn't have any problems being recognized or acknowledged to be seen as it sees itself. Africa, on the other hand, <laughs> has, has, has that exact problem. It's not that we don't have an idea of ourselves, but it is not either recognized or agreed upon, whether it be in the media. So if I want to see myself as Haile, I want to be able to see uh, Desta um, and, and, and Zap Mama, who, who really were a groundbreaking duo uh, in music, how many people can remember who Zap Mama was? Uh, so, you know, it's the gaze and the consistency of that gaze and the recognition of the aspirational nature of its universal value um, of a particular experience of life. In our case, the African experience of life, which is as diverse as all of us having this conversation. Um, so at the African Union, I think, you know, from a policy uh, point, point of view, I think many of you who, who've studied this um, sort of more specifically than I have, know that there are countries who intentionally gone out to make sure that part of their policy making instruments had an element of soft power uh, in it. South Africa did, certainly after liberation where Ubuntu became a, a, a cornerstone of foreign policy for, for South Africa and has continued to be so. Um, and whether it be within the economic sphere, whether it be in the cultural sphere, certainly in the sporting arena, um, but all of it is so tied to how we were seen before, um, how to break down the barriers of a gaze that had stayed so long and had been so powerfully impacted on people's consciousness and so that we could be seen as ourselves, whether it be in Nollywood or, or elsewhere. Um, so I think when we talk about um, the policy making space, I think in oddly, I think it's the cultural space spaces in Africa and, 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 uh, and, and the opening up of technology where you have content generators are true. Um, you know, I have a 22 year old who's, who's a big TikToker, for example. Um, and um, they call themselves things like third generation or third culture kids. You have such a diversity of, 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 of African experiences that are gaining global uh, recognition and consensus because of not only their particular, uh, particularity, but because of the universality of a certain type of life experience in which I think in, in African policy spaces, we, we have seen before we saw, you know, I don't know, in a previous life, I used to work in the cinema industry and there, there is still a, a, a festival, Pan-African festival called Fispako uh, that came out of Ouagadougou, which was started as an idea very long time ago in 1969. It was, the first time was in 1969, made really popular um, after the revolution with Thomas Sankara and really was, and is still recognized as who that was our Khan festival. I remember going in 1998, I think, and sewing uh, Jibril Diop Mambeti for the first time in Semben Usman. And I can tell you, having gone to Khan and to Fespako, um, it's a different, but ex exactly the same experience because it, 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 it the, 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 the electricity is the same. So how do we make that real in a contested geopolitical space um, or by, uh, where African experience is contested by the powerful and by ourselves? Uh, um, I don't have an answer to that, but there are certain examples I think that we could certainly talk about tonight. Thank you so much, Eva, for that incredible lecture. Um, a, co a couple of things I picked up that I thought was really interesting. Um, you spoke about, I think this is when we, when we start talking about how do we change this, right? That we have 
soft power that is not recognized or agreed upon. So systematically, we are trying to understand how do we present ourselves. You talked about the intentionality um, by states to create, you know, to use soft power as a leverage and then breaking down barriers as the gaze. You talked about how the gaze, how allowing people to see us for who we, who we truly are and how that has been a problem in the past. Um, to your daughter, who is a TikToker, <laughs> I too am a third culture kid. You know, I grew up in Nigeria, but I lived in the Caribbean. I've lived in the US, I've lived in, in the Middle East. So I understand that idea of, of the universality of your experience, even though you are African. And we had a class with um, Zoe Marx and we, we spoke about Afropolitanism. And there's a yes. quote that says, don't ask me where I'm from, ask me where I'm local. And it's like, how do you begin to express yourself as an African in a global space and use that to, to get to leverage influence? Thank you so much for that. Tisa, I am going to come to you. So you're a tax commissioner right now, but I know that you've 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 been you've worked extensively in communications and production, you know, production space, and you've you've also been really, really active in, in the civic space. You've worked in um, you've done work with different different organizations, the Rockdale County Public Schools, Parent Advisory Council, um, the National Council of Negro Women. So you you have put your hands into the pie of this. I want you to talk a little bit about from the perspective of being um, being a person of African descent in in the in in America, and how have you seen soft power? leveraged or not so what is it that you see soft what role do you see soft power play in the experiences that you've had um, in your work and and in your in your life as as an, uh, an african a woman of african descent Ada, thank you for um for um inviting me to to serve on this amazing panel i'm i'm, I'm excited i'm over here taking notes <laughs> so i'm learning uh so much already um, I would say that for me as first generation American, my parents are from the Caribbean, as well as being the first African American woman to be elected to the position that I hold right now. Um, collaboration has been the only way that I have been able to lead. I think that a lot of times when we talk about um, leadership and we talk about aspiring to um, certain positions as as people of African descent, as women, um, that all of the literature out there and all of the advice that we get is around how white men do it. And what I've, what I've realized is that I can't do what they do. I can't, I can't move in the same way that they move. And so I've had to figure out how do I lead as my authentic self? How do, and, and for me, that has always been by leveraging the power of partnership. Mm. Um, you know, I, I um, a while ago, I went through some type, some a professional development uh, program and you, we had to, um, we had to go through this um, personality test. You know, they put you through all of these personality tests so that you know how you show up in the world. And, you read the literature, you, you read the books, you listen to the podcast, and they say, this is how you um, exert power. Mm. And one of the things that I learned from that experience is that I can't do it the way that they do it. That I have to do it in a way that is authentic to me. I have to do it in a way that's going to be effective because, because it does not have the same effect if I try to mirror what other people do. One of the things that, um, you know, Eba said that was so powerful was that in the conversation about soft power, I think your intention, your nat natural inclination is to focus on the soft instead mm -hmm. of the power. And that there's a certain level of ownership that we have to take in understanding that, that we, we desire to move in this, we desire to have this power to exert power, but we just need to do it in a different way. Mm. And that there's a, a there's a, a, a level of responsibility that comes along with that as well. That when we have decided that we are going to lead other people, that we're going to lead organizations, that we're going to, um, 
represent our community, especially in this global, this global on this global landscape, that there is um, a responsibility that we have to harness that power and to use it in a very responsible way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Lisa. Um, great. So I am really excited by the way every each of the panelists has approached this question. We've looked at it from the creative side. We've looked at it from governance and policy and then the barriers. And then looking at it from how do we ourselves um, as Tisa said, partnerships, one being important and how, how, you, how you build influence. But how do you appear as your authentic self and how do you use that? Um, I wanted to ask um, a question around, again, I'm going to go back to something that you said in Kiru in, um, on, your, on your page, you talked about so you made this, this statement that you say, you said, we are convinced that ultimately, you know, when Africa is king, black people everywhere are stronger, right? And I wanted to ask a question around that image, which is something, which is kind of what Eber was saying, that we need to be able to create an image where we, we, we represent ourselves and people see us for who we are. When I look at, for instance, the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm sorry to bring that in here, but I think it's a question that, mm -hmm. that I think is important. We talked a little bit about, I want to ask a little bit about what they call epi epistemic justice, because a lot of the questions that are coming out during COVID-19 was, you know, African countries seem to have sort of gotten a hang of how are we handling this thing? And there was a lot of questions about why is it not, why is it not, um, having as much impact in Africa, what are they doing differently? But I don't know then if the world saw the continent as a bastion of knowledge when it came to solutions for COVID-19. And I wanted to ask in terms of the way Africa is seen, um, which is one of the things everybody spoke about, the barriers, right? How are we as seen and the way we present ourselves? Can soft power bridge that gap? Eba, you want to say something? <laughs> No, oh my goodness. Oh, my video is on. <laughs> well, it, it's really interesting that you brought up COVID-19 because I was thinking about that today and I was thinking, hmm, maybe I shouldn't. Um, um, you know, there, there's two realities about it. There's, there's soft power next to hard power. And right. soft power right. is a negotiation because you don't have hard power. Uh, or hard power would not work. When it comes to COVID, co there's nothing aspirational about the pandemic. There's certainly nothing aspirational. <laughs> um, so what's, what's really strange about this, and I remember the first, uh, the facts are this, the only continent that had a continental response to COVID-19 was Africa. The first COVID, and I'm sorry, I know too much about this than, than, than is reasonable, but it's not my fault. Um, the first COVID case in um, Africa was on Valentine's Day in Luxor in Egypt, 2020. That was on the 14th of February. On the 22nd of February of the same, uh, of the same year, all of the health ministers of the continent were here in Addis Ababa. Mm. to come to thrash out a continental response. But do you know why we were so good at it? Because at least 100 of all sort of public health incidents of pandemic potential in the world occur on our continent. So not only do we know about it, we have it all the time. In fact, when COVID hit, we were already in a pandemic mode because of Ebola. Right. So right. by the time COVID hit, all of the African, um, if you are coming from the Congo, all of the, all of the, you, you, you needed, you, you know, there was the hand washing, mm -hmm. you know, those physical distancing um, uh, constraints sure, were well known to us, even, and in West Africa, because of the 2014, 2017 um, uh, Ebola uh, epidemic. So, mm -hmm. so the world was sort of being introduced to a pandemic. We were veterans. 
So the fact that the world was like, so why are they not dying? It's only because A, we have better resources. We have better responses to, to pandemics because we experience them more often. Mm -hmm. And also there's an, in, 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 in just in African communal living, when you have pandemics like Ebola and COVID where proximity is important, the, 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 the natural African idea of how to live in a community comes to bear. Mm -hmm. So the notion of communal responsibility for everybody. So it's the I am because you are the whole Ubuntu Ubuntu. thing is not something that you need to legislate in, in many African in, in, in African culture. But apparently you had to legislate that in the United States and still, you know, um, be confronted with a groundswell of, 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 of protest and, and resistance to it, huh? to individual rights. Um, so the, the, the COVID-19 response of the African continent was known by all countries and the powerful, huh? but we weren't the main story. They were their own story. So again, then it's the gaze and the importance of that gaze to, to who and for what reason. Mm. Uh, so the COVID-19, it, you can't exert soft power when you cannot, when you when you don't have hard power. So you can't exert soft power, um, even from a storyline point of view. Surely, you know, it's not as if we didn't say it. We said it all the time. Um, but that wasn't the story that people were interested in the global north. They were interested in why it is that we were not dying. Thank you for that. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> I want to ask if there were if there are any questions, um, please put them in the Q and A. Um, but I want to ask each of you to reflect on what is it that you see needs to happen. We've made it clear that one soft power is important, but it's also important relative to also to hard power, and that you have to you need both. And when you don't have one, then sort of yes. the other has to keep either make up or suffer. Right. So, um, Desta, let me ask you in terms of the arts and theater and how we use soft power to elevate the conversations to add to and to elevate our influence as Africans and people of, and people of African descent. What is it that you see that is missing or that we that needs to be done better? Um, in the past few weeks, I've been interviewing different film directors because uh, October 28th and November 6th, we have the 10th edition of Film Africa. So at Royal African Society, we've reached out to past participants of Film Africa and we've been interviewing them or asking for Vox Pops. And so I've, I've had the, the privilege of interviewing some really fantastic um, directors recently. Uh, Diodo Hamadi from Congo, Usman mm -hmm. Sameseko from Mali, um, most recently Amjad Abu Alala from Sudan. Um, and I've, I've asked them a series of questions and something that keeps coming back to me is that, you know, yes, it's wonderful that we're being Oscar nominated and we're being showered with awards and all of this. But the fact remains that not so many people in our own countries are able to see our films. Mm -hmm. So, you know, directors from all over Africa are telling me this and, and I asked them, you know, why do you think that is? And, you know, the, the reasons vary. So some believe that it's the governments just aren't supporting the arts enough. You know, there might, there, there aren't necessarily enough cultural centers or cinemas or schools for the arts, or, you know, in many, um, countries, there's a belief that it's not a job, get a real job, you know. Um, my father ended up being the poet laureate of Eritrea, but our mm -hmm. whole family, until he did something on CNN, they were like, what, what craziness are you doing? Why are you sharing your, your nonsense online? Like, you don't need to do this. But as soon as it got outside recognition, it was like, oh, wow. Um, but yeah, I think it's really critical that we examine some of these reasons that these film directors are putting forward that besides lack of access or lack of arts and culture platforms, um, the fact that this soft power has kind of clobbered everyone over the head because everyone was growing up watching American this and that or British this and that or French 
to coming back to what you mentioned about the French language, I agree with Susanna. I think it must link, be Lingala. Um, but I grew up okay. st in, in Abidjan. Um, and, you know, I moved around after that with my parents, but I took French my whole school life, including in French speaking African countries. But there was not ever any use of any African or Caribbean um, artists or music or anything. Wherever, even in Abidjan, it was Asterix and Obelix. It was, um, you know, just French from France. I had no idea that almost 30 countries in the world spoke French because no one at school told me that. None of my teachers told me that because France was the be all and, and end all. So um, I think, yeah, being aware of soft power because it can be negative, you know, so American or French soft power means that we're not at all uh, using our own. And then also, um, even though that there are so many African films now getting shown all over the world and Oscar nominated and all, a lot of the, the directors are feeling crumpled that, you know, it's the, the films aren't celebrated at the same level or shown or seen or spoken about on the same level at home because A, there's not enough arts and culture platforms and B, um, people are so used to being force fed uh, you know, movies and, and music from around the world that that we don't give the same value to our own um, our own powerful arts and culture as we do to exterior uh, offerings. Thank you, Desta. That's incredibly, incredibly valid. Um, Tisa, I wanted to ask you about one, your experience in the film industry, you know, especially in here in the US. Um, what impact do you think that has had or is having in the way the African-American experience is lived um, and portrayed? And what impact do you think that, 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 yeah, so what impact do you think that will have on the way, as Eva said, you know, the way people view themselves and, ex and, and experience and express themselves um, do you think that it is helping or hurting um, the, the community? I think once we get outside of um, the mainstream um, productions, then it's definitely um, a space or a landscape where we are able to tell our own stories in the way that we are experiencing them. So they're not, um, when you look at the at, at mainstream productions, whether that be um, film or television, a lot of times it's based on, again, what 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 a white man has deemed is a reflection of the black experience in America. And we need to get to the point where we're in positions of decision making positions and understanding that the responsibility that we have, is to tell our authentic stories, tell our stories and control our own narrative and move out of the space where we are um, trying to appease the mainstream versus telling our story, whether they feel like it will make money or not, whether it's marketable or not, that we have to stay true to the stories that are true to us. I think um, what Desta said was, um, was very, um, important when she talked when she touched on access, whether that's access um, of stories from the African diaspora told here in the U.S. Um, those of us that are in positions to provide access have a responsibility to do so. And unfortunately, a, a lot of times when we get into those positions of power, when we get into those positions of leadership, we don't see that as our responsibility. There's no there's no point in me having a seat at the table if I am not gonna advocate for the people that did not. There's no point in me showing up and showing up in the room if we're gonna have the same conversations that we had when I was not there. And I think when it comes to, to soft power, especially when it comes to power in general, we have to be, there. there is a, <laughs> those of us in, um, in, in our cohort, um, right now, um, no Hassani Pratt. Oh yeah. And yes, and Hassani 
is a master of taking up space. And one of the things that the conversations that I've had with her recently is that um, having access is one thing, knowing what to do with the access is something different. Mm. We are, a, a lot of times we are so happy to just be in the room. We're just so happy to get the invitation that when we get there, we don't take, um, we don't see that we have an obligation, that we have a responsibility to do something different. Hassani, <laughs> Hassani is a master at that. And that's something that I think that we can all learn and that we need to understand. It is my responsibility that if I have access to make sure that you have access as well that you have a platform, that you um, are given an opportunity. It's not just enough for me to make it there. And I think at, at its core, that's um, a part of what soft power is, understanding that the power is not just for me, that there is mm -hmm. a level of beyond me leadership that is necessary in me exerting that soft power. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that reflection. Um, we have a question from Haja, but before we take it, um, Gabe, thank you for your comment around um, you compared Cuba's soft power with the hard power of the USA in, in Afghanistan. So thank you for your comment. Um, Haja has a question, actually it's two questions. And um, she says, thank you for a great conversation. Could you expand upon how African governments can integrate more soft power into their policies? and how they provide more meaningful support to soft power actors um, in the arts and the music and, and film. And then the second question, she said, Desta touched upon the role of language. Could all the panelists speak on that, particularly on the use of colonial languages in school and government over indigenous languages? So in Kiri, I'm going to come to you to, because you're, you're an, the Africa Soft Power Project is, you know, is in this conversation around how can we integrate more soft power. So, what would you say to the first question around how African governments can integrate more soft power into their policies um, and provide meaningful support? You're muted. So thank you, Ada. Um, I think, um, let me start with um, just sort of very quickly um, speaking to what Tisa was talking about in terms of taking up space and knowing um, when you then take up the space, what to do with it. I think that's exactly what we're trying to do at Africa so far. What you've noticed around is that there are no real Africa platforms. All the platforms, all the global platforms are not actually owned by Africans or black people really. And so how do we sort of like take up space and how do we then sort of create voices where we bring ourselves together and propel ourselves forward? So that's a core part of what we're trying to do. And Tisa also talked about collaboration being, you know, like not working in silos. And I think that's one of the things we haven't as a continent done well, apart from this COVID thing where we have actually, we did a pretty good job with COVID. And I use that as an example because, you know, when we're talking about soft power, for example, where we keep saying it's it's not really just about the creative industries or uh, it's just that the creative industries offer a great avenue of sort of like, you know, uh, um, pronouncing soft power. But if you think about America's soft power, it's, it's Hollywood as much as it is meta, as much as it is um, Elon Musk going on, you know, acquiring Twitter. It's those conversations. We are literally watching it, you know, we're watching everything you, when you think about America, you think about all of these things as Twitter, it's Google, it's, it's, it's NASA, it's, you know, so that's, Part of the soft power conversation we focus on creative industries and knowledge industries and technology because africa is such a young continent i, I think 70 percent of africans are under um, 30 or 25 and so we think that and um, the creative industries technology offers africa the biggest you know uh, opportunity and that's where government comes in without infrastructure young people are not seen i remember i think someone talked about i think it was dessa who talked about growing up and you know, music and film being seen as nothing. And that's how African parents, you know, you had to be a doctor or a lawyer and there was nothing in between. If you weren't a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, I mean, that's it. And we see that in, in, you know, in the West, that's not actually the case. You know, we're, we're talking Beethoven and we're talking about Mozart and we're talking about all the stuff that, you know, we do have here, but nobody sort of, nobody taught us how to do those things. In terms of, we've had culture for, you know, 
hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. But it's sort of like almost that like the African culture is not the same level because we haven't propelled it different, I mean, um, forward. So that's really for me very important is government pay, paying attention to the, you know, what young people can do. It's government sort of understanding that Burner Boy selling out Madison Square Garden is directly relevant to business in, in Accra or in Nigeria because then somebody, an investor is seeing that and thinking, I'm going to come and invest money. So when we start seeing, you know, young people and what young people offer, it becomes a really serious conversation when we're talking about soft power. So for me, soft power is not just about um, uh, um, culture and creativity. It's really right. about how, you know, it's about private sector. It's about, you know, industry. It's about all of the things that, you know, make countries great and then combining to make Africa great. And just before we go, I, in terms of, you talked about where Africa is, um, when Africa is strong, um, Black people everywhere uh, uh, um, are stronger. Yeah. And I, I think we wrote that because we had a soft power um, session and it was an African-American. And she said, well, if you're so about collaboration, why is it called Africa soft power and not all oh, black people soft power? And I said, well, you know, I mean, black people soft power is very long. Africa soft power is, you know, is short and precise, but, um, you know, when when it doesn't matter that African Americans do not immediately see themselves as Africans, but at one time they were Africans. At one time they were from here. And if someone is trying to shoot you, they're not asking you if you're black, you're black. Everywhere you go, you're black. So nobody's asking you where you're coming from when something is going wrong. And if someone is seeing you as a shithole, coming from a shithole, if they think we're a shithole, that means you two are shithole because you're black. And that means that in, if you're in the Caribbean, you're a shithole. And if you're in Brazil, you're a shithole. So you're coming from all of these shithole countries. And so if we don't sort of begin to recognize the power of collaboration, the power of sort of like seeing ourselves, you know, it becomes like, it's, you know, like for me, like, you know, building the bridge is not us against them, you know, with this whole, with black people is like, oh, Africans think African-Americans are them and we're us. We have to actually shift that and then begin to say, there's a unity that we can bring that, you know, brings power to the table. And that I think is really, really important. And Africa is sort of like, you know, as someone said, Africa is multiracial. This is true. This is, this is, this is very, very true. Uh, um, but I will focus on, you know, the global black community and in terms of people who went away from, you know, from here to, from here to other continents. But yes, Africa is multi, multiracial. There are actually white people in South Africa and many other countries as well. So, um, and in that case, Africa suffice for everybody who identifies identifies as African in one way or the other, whether black, white, uh, or um, any other color, including Indians who are also Africans. Thank you so much, Nkiru. Um, Eba, do you want to weigh in on the question around how African governments can integrate more soft power into their policies? I think you spoke a little bit about it, but, um, and then how to support the, uh, the arts. We are a little bit short on time, and I wanted to get to the second question as well, but please, I'd like you to weigh in on that. Uh, sorry. Um, I hope I understood the question correctly. Well, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to sort of flip it. I think African countries do a great deal. Uh, it's just that not everybody knows what it is that they're doing. And while right. we're concentrating, um, I've 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 got the, the, the you know the biggest privilege and honor to be able to work for the African Union Commission, and to work on behalf of 55 uh, member states of the continent having traveled to all of them and seeing what governments are doing and what clearly people do not know. The African Union is, uh, is an idea that came through uh, solidarity, through collaboration, because we wanted to be seen as ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we created a union for Africans while we were trying to get political independence as the OAU. So for me, that is almost the epitome of what soft power is all about. We, a band of men, yeah, it was men, yeah, in 1962 got together. Um, many of them were not independent yet. Yeah? And they decided this is who we are and this is how we want to be seen from now until we are all free. That's how the organization of African unity came about. Um, so if that's not soft power, I don't know what is. Then, you know, in, and then in the year 2000, the African Union came about because by then, most of the African countries had already got independent, political independence, which was the objective of the um, organization of African unity. Now is really around, um, you know, peace, uh, prosperity, and, 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 and the absence of war. And, and for the most part, you know, you don't see uh, interstate conflict at all. But again, the, the narrative is such that people believe it. 
that there is, you know, that, that we mired in conflict and whatsoever. But and the soft power of what we possess, I see what African states and nations are doing in terms of pharmaceuticals for African indigenous plants that are used all over um, the global pharmaceutical industry for cancer, for um, many of the, 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 the active ingredients and some of the most essential medicines of, in, in the world come from this continent. We know it. Uh, how it is to impart, share, and make it stand on par with, you know, the Viagras of the world for example, you know, um, everybody seems to know what Viagra is, but nobody knows what a cola nut is and what a cola nut can do. But mm. us Africans, we do. What we share, what we choose to share. I think there's also another part of the conversation in terms of what Africans decide to keep to themselves because the danger has always been too great. So soft power is something that, um, I think it's, 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 it's and, I, and I've been thinking about this as we're talking, that we want to be able to persuade and coerce on what we feel proud of and what we feel aspirational. The rest right. of our experiences as, as Africans, and, and even the way, you know, sort of cinema in the United States and the world has changed in terms of its gaze of the black person, whether it's, you know, the horror film Get Out, uh, Django, for example, um, Abbott uh, uh, Elementary, all of this, and you know, and 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 the Netflix, which has very African uh, programming. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in the last fifteen years, in terms of soft power and the gaze of the African on the world, has changed. Huh? Um, I think that's an important step that we must be able to recognize and also mm -hmm. that people can now forcefully and not be taken to be being, you know, difficult for saying that, you know, African art needs to come back to Africa. Nobody ever thought that that was even an issue. Huh? Now it is not only a political issue, it's also a public perception issue. Um, so now all of a sudden you have Western powers tripping over themselves, trying to find the language that can sort of straddle between something that is acceptable to their public perceptions of being um, responsible people who would be bringing back what is not theirs. Mm. And, 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 you know, and then, uh, so I think the, not only is the language changing, but the gaze is changing and there's more carefulness. People on, you know, the global North is more careful with how and how they define us when we are not in the room. And that's good. Can I add, can yeah, I add one, ahead, um, one thing to that, um, to what Ebba said? Um, it was very powerful when she said that the gaze is, is, is different. And I think part of that comes from those of us in the African diaspora see ourselves mm -hmm. differently. And we've mm -hmm. gotten to the point where we define, we um, identify ourselves mm -hmm that we no longer fit into this box that you have created for me mm -hmm. to say that I cannot connect to my African roots because I was mm -hmm. not necessarily born there. That mm -hmm. there's, there's a, a embracing and a, a reconciliation, especially mm -hmm. from a lot of um, black people in America um, that is happening, that has happened over the, the last couple of years and it is, it's exciting to see and it's exciting to be a part of. Because when I grew up in this country, there was not this celebration of your Africanness that I see mm -hmm. now. And mm -hmm. um, it's wonderful to see that young people are embracing it in their lives far, far younger or far earlier than, you know, maybe some of us older, more seasoned, um, seasoned people, people have, so. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Tisa. Desta, um, I actually wanted to ask you to comment on that second question around language, but I mean, as a creative yourself, this question around how, I mean, you, you spoke to it a little bit about how people are saying that they can't, we can't watch our films, you know, on the continent, in our countries, they're not as popular as elsewhere. Um, but if you have anything else to chip into that question, and then maybe to also look at this question around language and the use of colonial languages. Sure. Um, yeah, just quickly. I mean, I think it, it always comes back to education and also where you're able to see yourself. So I remember my parents uh, getting me a book when I was a kid and it was, you know, it was customized to me. So it had my name in it and it said, 
you know, as you're reading this holiday dragon book in in Pine Gardens, Bridgetown, Barbados, we lived there for a while. Um, this is, you know, so I was amazed because it was me in a book. I was five or six, but the child in the book was white. So I was like, huh? But I guess they just didn't have the option in the shop to have a child of any other color. So I was really pleased last year to get my six year old goddaughter who's Malian, you know, uh, also a customized book, but but it looked like her. So I think it's really important to to be able to see for young people, for children to be able to see themselves in these spaces. Uh, my godson and his brothers live in Atlanta and I subscribe them to. Um, yeah. Uh, I just describe I subscribe them to Jumbo Books, which is great because it's a box delivered every month, um, and they get you know books from with children that look like them. I remember one book in particular had like really typical Abisha kind of Eritrean Ethiopian stylistic drawings, and that was their favorite favorite because they really saw their culture in the pages. So I think governments can really focus on education as always and getting, um, making sure children see themselves in these spaces. It's vital. I think governments can also, you know, support the creatives who are doing it for the people. Um, a great example is Blitz the Ambassador, who's a Ghanaian multi polymath hyphen it. Uh, now he's directing The Color Purple on Broadway, um, co-produced by Oprah Winfrey. But he was a rapper and then he financed his own film, The Burial of Kojo. And then he now he's painting. Um, so he was really someone who took his creativity the, to the next level and sponsors Accra Film Society. So he shows films, he and his team show films outside in a park to make sure everybody can see those films anywhere. Um, so I think governments can focus on those two things, education and supporting the creatives who are already uh, starting these community initiatives. Um, and also, I think, um, as Kiru mentioned, that it's also economy, you know, these festivals bring in uh, a lot of money. People go to Dakar to see the Biennale, people go to Art X Lagos, people go, people travel for music festivals and theater festivals and, you know, um, so, so these things translate into economy as well. Um, language wise, I'm particularly obsessed with one book by Dr. Kofi Agau. It's called The African Imagination in Music. And it talks about how important it is to, to respect and teach and cling on to indigenous languages because, you know, they will be run over. If you look at official languages in Africa, nine times out of 10, they're their European languages. I think Equatorial Guinea has three official languages that are English, French and Spanish, if I'm not wrong, like officially. So I think it's really important that we that we encourage uh, more African languages, especially, you know, um, outside the diaspora, not to lose it. There's a wonderful book um, also um, by a, a Czech um, writer, Julie Sedivi called Memory Speaks. And she talks about, you know, how important language is um, not just on a kind of day to day level, but on a, on a spiritual level. So I really recommend those two books, The African Imagination and Music by Dr. Kofi Agawu and Memory Speaks by Dr. Julie Sedivi um, in terms like, yeah, that, that will answer a lot of questions, Aja, yeah, I think in terms of uh, how important um, indigenous languages are um, for me. That's really interesting. Because, you know, I have many peers who struggle with language, not because they don't want to teach their children their mother tongue, but because they live in spaces and places where it's difficult to keep on uh, uh, speaking their indigenous languages. So I, 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 am, I have very mitigated views on who speaks it, um, you know, I have three children. I spoke to them in my mother tongue until they were three years old, all of them. Um, and I can tell you, my peers um, gave me a very hard time saying that, you know, you, you're extremely educated, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you want your children to sound like villagers. I think I'm very, I'm very sensitive to how we 
don't support ourselves, when we're trying to, to hold on to what is dear to us, because we are trying to fit into spaces that are not ours uh, in particular. So when you can find, and I find that, you know, now you see that, you know, there's younger children like in South Africa, in my country, um, who are trying to learn their languages as adults now, which I think is beautiful. You know, I, I, I read in my own, I, my, my parents would only read to me in my mother tongue. They said, that English is yours. Huh? Um, so I think how we navigate who we are and how we want to be seen with, with our children and other generations, it's a traumatic and uncomfortable conversation. And maybe these are the spaces we should be able to have these, these unanswerable questions to our dilemmas <laughs> as well. And, 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 and I'm glad you brought up language and, and multiraciality, for example, um, um, of, of Africans and people of African, of African descent. Sometimes these are conversations that don't have to have answers. In fact, they might even create more dilemmas, but they are part of our experience. Um, and, 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 and I think that places like these and where we can talk about soft power is where we are vulnerable and where we are strong and where can we be strong in our vulnerability. Mm. It's definitely the thing that's impacted me the most language wise, um, because my whole life I just struggled with language learning because I just the way it's taught at school, I think is dreadful. But as soon as I started doing backing vocals for different artists, I found that two to three months working for an artist, I had to learn about 20 songs. And in 20 songs, you know, you learn enough to get by because every song everywhere in the world, people are singing about the same thing. People are using the 500 most used vocabulary. Um, and so for me, that's why I started something called Languages Through Music in 2014, because that was the most effective way. So I spent 12 years learning French in school, not getting anywhere. As soon as I found a, a group that I loved, I could speak it. And the same happened with Portuguese. And then Tigrinha music, my dad didn't speak to me Tigrinha growing up, you know, perhaps for these reasons of, oh, you know, she needs to really focus on having strong English. Where is she going to use Tigrinha outside of Eritrea? And so it was really for me, since my family's all scattered refugees, Minnesota, DC, Atlanta, um, it's really music and, and old records that have given me. My, more, more of my vocabulary than anything else. So yeah, I find in terms of education, music has totally revolutionized how I learn languages and how I teach, I taught, I, I still teach languages. Um, so definitely to be able to harness that and to shake up our school system in so many ways. I think we should all be able to leave school at 18 with three, four languages, you know, if it's, if we're using music or if we're using more creative ways of, education. You are muted, Ada. You are muted. Sorry. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Desta. Um, thank you, Eba and Kiru, Tisa, for this incredible conversation around um, soft power and how it can be used to catalyze the transformation of, African, of Africans and peoples of African descent. And we're actually over time. And so um, we actually need to round up. Thank you so much for everyone who has joined in for sharing your, your questions, for being part of this conversation. It's been quite enriching. We'll post the recording once it's ready. Um, I wanna say thank you again to the Harvard University, for, the University Center for African Studies for their partnership with us and to the Africa Soft Power Project. And I just wanted to give um, and here an opportunity to share a little bit as the partner here to talk a little bit about um, the Africa Soft Power Project and what's coming up. Um, thanks, Ada. Thanks, everybody. That was great. Um, I wanted to quickly say something about young people um, in terms of how African governments can support. I, I do think that one of the things that we haven't um, um, done really well as Africans is respect for young people. I think that's a core part of what we should be channeling. Um, we see that for such a young population, uh, you know, uh, young voices are not actually given the platform that they deserve. And so I think that's really important. And then I just would, uh, you know, want to share that we are having an um, a event in Kigali, Rwanda, um, this May. Uh, for us, May is Africa Month. The whole idea about May is that, you know, there's um, Black History Month in February. 
Um, there's Black History Month in October for the UK, um, February is the US, there's Women's Month in March, but there's nothing that's really Africa Month and we feel like Africa, you know, creating an Africa Month, which is where it's, we're saying May should be Africa Month. So creating that month where everybody can celebrate Africa, whether you're white or you're black, whatever color you are, celebrate Africa in May. I mean, celebrate Africa all year, but in May, and we're doing Kigali because Kigali is a great place to be. The basketball um, Africa League is playing in Kigali. So come to Rwanda, come hang out with us, come, you know, um, watch basketball, come play basketball, come listen to great people, come just do great things um, in Rwanda. And so we'd love to see you soon. And thank you again to, um, to everybody who is here. And thanks to the uh, um, Africa Policy Journal for uh, sort of hosting this and, you know, asking us to come along on this journey with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, thank you. And have an incredible day, everyone, and happy Africa Month. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you said it. <laughs> thank you all. Lovely to meet you. Hi, thank you. Lovely, Bye. lovely conversation. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Incredible, incredible conversation. Thanks, David. <laughs> okay. Nobody wants to log off. <laughs> One second, let me. I'm trying. <laughs>